Hello students. So today we're going to be learning about Punnett squares, and this might be something you've learned about already in a previous biology class, but even if it isn't, don't worry because it's going to be a lot easier than you might be expecting. We're going to start by going through what we already learned about last week, and then we're going to do some examples together before you complete a few on your own. So let's start with the stuff we already know. Last week we talked about how genes are sections of DNA that code for proteins, and proteins determine your traits. Now a trait is an organism's physical characteristic. So there are lots of examples of this. Your hair color, your skin color, your height, your weight, your eye color. If we stick with the example of eye color, we can imagine that in your cells there's a section of DNA that makes a protein, and that protein is responsible for making the pigment in your eyes that will determine their color. Now, we all have a gene for eye color, but we don't all have the same color eyes. That's because there are different versions of genes, and these are our alleles. Now, obviously, in reality, there are many different eye colors, but to make this simple, let's imagine that there are only two. There's a big B brown allele, for eye color and a little b blue allele for eye color. Now an organism's genotype refers to the different alleles it inherits from both parents, written as capital and lowercase letters. So you could get one big B allele from your dad and one big B allele from your mom. You could get a big B allele from one parent and a little b allele from the other. Or you could get two little b alleles. These would all be your genotype. Your phenotype refers to the trait that's actually expressed. What does that genotype look like? So we're going to write this as a description. For example, brown eyes or blue eyes. Now the way that I remember this is G for gene. The genotype refers to your genetics, what's actually in your cell. And P for physical. The phenotype refers to what you actually look like or what that trait will actually be expressed as. So if we imagine our eye color example, you could have the genotype of big B, big B, and the phenotype of brown eyes, or you could have the genotype of little b, little b, and the phenotype of blue eyes. In both of these cases, you got one allele from your mom and one allele from your dad. Now, there are two different combinations of alleles that we need to know. And these are pretty easy for us because we already know that homo means same and hetero means different. So if you are homozygous, that means that you have two of the same allele. You could be homozygous dominant and have two dominant alleles, in this case, big B, big B, or you could be homozygous recessive and have two recessive alleles, in this case, little b, little b. You could also be heterozygous, which means that you have different alleles, one dominant allele and one recessive allele, or in this case, big B and little b. Now remember that the big letter is always going to be dominant to the little letter. So if you are heterozygous and you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, we're going to see that dominant allele in your phenotype. So although your genotype might be big B, little b, your phenotype is going to be brown because that big B dominant allele is going to dominate the recessive allele. Now that's everything we learned last week. If any of that is still confusing, before we move on, I want you to pause the video here and rewind to watch that a few more times. Once you've got it, we're ready to move on. Now that you've got the vocab down, let's talk about an example. So in the gene for snail speed, let's assume that there are just two alleles. There's a dominant big S for slow and a recessive little s for fast. If a heterozygous dad mates with a heterozygous mom, what will their offspring look like? We can use a Punnett square to predict this and determine the probability or the chance of their offspring having each genotype and phenotype. 
Now this might seem like an odd example and you're wondering who the heck cares about what a snail would look like, but this is something we could use for dogs if you were going to breed two dogs and you were curious what traits they could have. It's something we could use for some human traits. In fact, there's a joke that biology teachers on first dates will sit down and do Punnett squares on the napkins at the restaurant to figure out what traits their offspring could have. So in this very simple thing that we're about to learn, there's a lot of predictive power to potentially predict what your offspring would look like and what genes they would carry. So you remember from last week, this idea of segregation. And that means that when dad makes gametes or sex cells, we're going to segregate his two alleles. Now remember the difference between diploid and haploid. Diploid cells in your body have two copies of every allele, while haploid cells have only one, or think half, haploid for half. So dad's diploid cells here have two alleles, big S and little s, but his haploid gametes are only going to have one of those. What we're going to do at the top of our Punnett square is write what both of dad's gametes will be. And the first one's going to have a big S, while the second one has a little s. Then we'll do the same thing on the side here with mom. And mom's diploid cells have one big S and one little s, which means that she'll make some haploid cells with that big S and some haploid cells with that little s. Now, before we move any further, I want to pause and really make sure that you understand what we did there. Because a lot of people rush through Punnett squares and they get the answers right, but they kind of miss the point. What we're doing here is predicting based on the different gametes that dad could make and the different gametes that mom could make, what their offspring would be like. So we're saying that if dad has these two alleles, he could make sperm cells with just the big S and he could make sperm cells with just the little s. And in fact, half of his sperm cells will have that dominant allele, while half of his sperm cells have the recessive one. At the same time, mom will have half of her eggs with a big S and half of her eggs with a little s. So what this means is dad's two possible gametes combining with mom's two possible gametes. And this is our idea of segregation playing out. We're kind of simulating or predicting what would happen if these parents reproduced. What are all the possible combinations we could get and what's the chance that we get each one of them? So to do this, it's really easy. And if you've already done it before, that's awesome. If you haven't, there's a good chance that you've done something called the box method in your math class, which is the same idea. All we're gonna do is go down and across. So in this first box, I'm going to go down from dad's gamete and across from mom's gamete. And that's going to give me an SS homozygous dominant offspring. Underneath this, I'm going to go down from dad's gamete and across from mom's gamete, which will give me a heterozygous offspring with one big S from dad and one little S from mom. Over here, I'm gonna go down from dad and across from mom. And I'm always gonna write the big one first, but I'll end up again with one big S and one little s, or a heterozygous offspring. Underneath this, I'm gonna go down and across. And I'll see here that I end up with two little s's, one from dad and one from mom, or a homozygous recessive offspring. So what I've done here in my Punnett square is simply predict what are the four possible combinations of mom and dad's gametes that I could get. And because there are four boxes and there's a 100% chance of having an offspring, what we're really showing is a 25% chance of this box, a 25% chance of this one, a 25% chance of this one, and a 25% chance of this one, 100% overall. So let's talk about what this means. By looking back at my Punnett square, I can see that there are three different genotypes I could end up with. The first one is my homozygous dominant genotype with two big S's. And if I look up here at my table, I can see that 25% of my offspring are going to inherit this homozygous dominant genotype. So I'm going to write in here 25% homozygous dominant, or one out of four would be homozygous dominant. I could also end up with heterozygous offspring, 
with one big S allele and one little s allele. If I look up at my table, 50% of my offspring have that heterozygous genotype. So I'm going to write in 50% heterozygous. And then finally, that leaves me with 25% of my offspring that will have a homozygous recessive genotype, or two little s's. So I'm going to add in here 25% would be homozygous recessive. Now those are my genotypes, but we remember that phenotype means the physical trait your offspring actually have. So I also need to look at these and figure out, well, what will those offspring look like? And because this big S is dominant to the little s, I know that in both of these cases, although the offspring have two different genotypes, I'm going to see that big S allele expressed. And if I look up here to remind myself that big S means slow, so all of these offspring, or 75% of my offspring, would have the slow phenotype, which leaves me with 25% of my offspring who inherit the fast phenotype. Now, to be totally clear here, this does not guarantee that if these parents had four offspring, three of them would be slow and one of them would be fast. A Punnett square tells us the probability or the chance of having offspring with each genotype and phenotype. So up next, you have three examples like this to do on your own. Before you do those, if you need to go back and watch what we just did a few more times to get the hang of it, do that. But then I want you to pause the video here while you work on those and come back once you finish these next three Punnett square examples. So now that we've got basic Punnett squares down, we're going to look at a big Punnett square. And here all we're doing is looking at two traits together. So in the gene for snail speed, let's assume that there are two alleles, same as before, big S for slow and little s for fast. But there are also two alleles in a separate gene for snail shape, big R for round, which is dominant, to little r for flat. And we want to know not just the probability of your offspring inheriting each trait for speed, but also the trait for shape. So we're going to do the same thing as before, but we're going to do it with two traits now. So if a father who's homozygous dominant for slow speed and heterozygous for shape mates with a mother who's heterozygous for slow speed and homozygous dominant for round shape, what genotypes and phenotypes will their offspring have? Again, we can use a Punnett square to predict it and determine the probability of their offspring having each genotype and phenotype, but this time it's going to be twice as much fun. So the first thing we need to do, once again, is figure out which gametes mom and dad could make. But here that's going to be a little bit more complicated. There was another idea we talked about last week at the very end of the notes called independent assortment. And that's just a really fancy way to say that all your different traits, all your different genes are going to be randomly shuffled up when gametes are made. So a gene for speed and a gene for shape are not connected. And if you have different alleles, they can be randomly mixed together in your gametes. And we're going to see what that looks like here. That'll make a lot more sense when we go through our gametes. But that's really what we're talking about here is independent assortment. So let's start with dad. Dad is homozygous dominant for speed and heterozygous for shape. So he's got two big S's, a big R, and a little r. And we want to figure out what are all the possible gametes that dad could make. So what are all the haploid combinations with one version of speed and one version of shape? Now one way to do this is just to look and figure it out. That's going to be a lot harder than the method that I'm going to teach you. So if that works for you, go for it. But I'd recommend using something called FOIL. And FOIL stands for first, outside, inside, last. So I'm going to show you how easy this is to figure out what gametes dad could make. So I'm going to start by taking the two first alleles, in this case, big S and big R. And I'm going to put those right here. Then I'm going to take the two outside alleles, in this case, big S and little r, and I'm going to put those next. Then I'm going to take the two inside alleles, in this case, big S and big r, and I'll write those. And then I'm going to take the two last alleles, 
in this case, big S and little r, and I'm gonna write those. In this case, I've color coded it to help you see it a little better, but all we're doing here is figuring out the four combinations of dad's alleles that we could end up with in his gametes. And we can see here that half of his sperm will have big S, big R, and half of his sperm will have big S, little r. Now let's do the same thing for mom. We're gonna go first and first, we're gonna go outside and outside. We're gonna go inside and inside. And we're gonna go last and last. Now this is just our setup. This is how we figure out through segregation and independent assortment, what are the different possible gametes or sperm and egg that mom and dad could make. Now we're gonna do exactly what we did before, but it's gonna just be twice as much fun. So let's set that up. On the top, just like before, I'm gonna write in all of dad's gametes. So I'm gonna take the first one, put it here, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with mom and I'm gonna spread out her possible gametes each in their own row over here on the left. Now we're gonna go down and across here, just like we did before. But before we do it together, I want you to pause the video here and try to do it on your own. So before you watch anymore, press pause and go back to your notes to try to do this on your own. Then come back and press play once you've finished just trying to fill in this table. So now that you've attempted this on your own, let's talk about what we did. If you did this correctly, you should have a table that looks like this. All I did here was go down and across for every box. And what that's gonna show me are all the possible combinations of mom's gametes and dad's gametes. So in this case, if this sperm cell and that egg cell came together, I would have an offspring with that genotype. Over here, this is another sperm cell and another egg cell giving me a different offspring with a different genotype. And my table as a whole shows me all the possible genotypes that the offspring of these two parents could have. Now the last thing we're gonna do is use this Punnett square to make a couple predictions about genotype and phenotype. The first thing I need to do is figure out what different genotypes I have. So looking up at my table here, I can see that I've got some that look like this. I've got some that look like that. I've got some that look like that. And I've got some that look like this. Now I need to figure out percentages and here's where the math gets just a little bit trickier because I have 16 boxes rather than four. But it's the same thing in principle. I'm gonna take the number of SSRR homozygous dominant individuals. So one, two, three, four. And I'm gonna divide that by the total number of boxes. So four divided by 16 will give me 25%. And you can do that on your calculator to check, but four over 16 or a fourth of these boxes is 25% big S, big S, and big R, big R. I'm gonna do the same thing here for my next genotype. And if I look, I've got one, two, three, four, so that's easy, another 25%. If I look for this one, I've got one, two, three, four, so make the math easy for us, another 25%. And then my last genotype with heterozygotes for both traits, or whoops, for heterozygotes for both traits, I've got another 25%. Check your math, add them up, 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 equals 100%. All right, I've done it right. I've predicted all of the possible offspring. Now I need to predict my phenotype, the physical trait that's expressed. So anywhere we see a big S, we know that's gonna be a slow snail. And anywhere we see a big R, we know that's gonna be a round snail. For this first one here, big S, big R, okay, I'm gonna have a slow round snail. For this one, big S, big R, another slow round snail. For this one, big S, big R, okay, another slow round snail. And for this one, oh, still another big S and big R. So that's also gonna be a slow round snail. That means that 100% of my offspring will be slow 
and round. And this shows us how important the difference between genotype and phenotype is. Although all of these parents' offspring would be slow and round, there are four different genotypes that they could have. Now this might not seem important right now because all the offspring are gonna look the same, but if those offspring go off and have their own kids, it's gonna matter if they're heterozygotes or homozygotes. And if this is a disease that we're talking about, not just the speed or shape of a snail, it's gonna make a really big difference whether your kids are carrying that disease or not. Now, the last thing you have to do today is one more example on your own. And this is gonna be an example of a big Punnett square like we just did. So at this point, if you need to, pause the video, same as before, and go back to rewatch what we just talked about. Once you feel like you've got that big Punnett square down, I want you to work through this example on your own. And once you've finished that and everything in your notes is completed, make sure you press turn in on Google Classroom to ensure that you get credit for these notes. If you have any questions about anything we've covered today, you can go back and watch this video again, or you can come to my office hours today between 1 and 2 p.m. at bit.ly slash Williams OH. I'm available there every day to answer any questions you have. We can go back through the notes. We can talk about extra examples or real life examples, or simply just talk about what's going on.